Hello, everyone. Buongiorno. As I said, como esta? Benevenito tutti. My name is Susan Damiani, and I am the director of gift planning and the director of the McAllen Society, which is our St. John's Legacy Society. And I'm welcoming you to our power hour number eight. I can't believe it's number eight already. And we're going to have a wonderful conversation and tour of Central Italy with Professor Douglas Contelmo. Hi, Doug. How are you? Hi, how's it going? Great to be here. How are things over in uh, Philadelphia? Uh, they're doing okay, yeah. <laughs> considering That's everything's good. going on, but uh, yeah. I'm excited to, you know, uh, take a break from that for the time being and do this sure. virtual tour with you. Terrific. Well, we're glad that you can join us. Uh, as I said, uh, Professor Cantelmo is going to give us a tour of Central Italy. And um, if some of you might have heard our earlier discussion, but uh, I have started about two years ago a travel program with our donors, and uh, we call it the uh, Globetrotter program. And uh, the first one was in Rome. And we had a wonderful time and we did it with Morocco tours and Professor Cantelmo uh, came with us and he did some side tours with the group. And we had a lot of fun, didn't we? Yeah, it was amazing. It was, it great, was great to have the uh, donors uh, be shown the Rome campus and part of St. John's global mission. So it was wonderful. Yes, you just reminded me, we had a wonderful reception with the faculty at the Rome campus, with the students. Uh, we had the ambassador uh, from the American embassy in, in Rome. Uh, he gave a talk. It really was very, very nice. And that evening turned out to be a spectacular evening because we were outdoors in, in the courtyard. And it was really great to see um, the university. And I was so jealous because uh, in my last year at St. John's was when they started the uh, study abroad program. It was called College Europa. And that was dating myself 1987 and i did not go but at that time they didn't go to rome they traveled to czechoslovakia and the and the wall had just come down and i was i have to admit i was a little fearful of going over and i thought it was still lots of turmoil and that's the reason why i didn't participate but when i look back i really am sorry that i didn't especially when we went to the Rome campus and saw the students studying, it's in a beautiful neighborhood and the campus is, is really nice. And I said, gee, I wish uh, I was a student again because it looks like a lot of fun. And what's nice, if you haven't been to the campus in Rome, it's very close to the Vatican. So it's in a, in a perfect location. And we went to the American College uh, which was wonderful. We had a beautiful mass and I will never forget it. I told you, I'm going to start to get choked up because I'm thinking about all these wonderful experiences uh, that we all shared as a group, as a St. John's group. And there was a mass, I would think maybe there was like over 200 young priests uh, and several priests on the altar. And it was such a magnificent mass. And I, it's, it's a, I'll never forget. And it was such a wonderful visit and they welcomed, welcomed us with open arms and uh, it was really great. So I'm looking forward, hopefully if we get past the pandemic, looking forward to future trips. In October, we were supposed to go to Paris uh, to celebrate the university's 150th anniversary and we will be postponing it and we will be going next October, 2021. So with that ado, let me just give you a little bit of um, background about Doug very quickly so you know uh, what his role is at the university. Doug is also a graduate. He's a double graduate, 2010 from St. John's College. You're making me feel old here, Doug. And 2014, what was your graduate degree in? My graduate degree was in uh, history. Uh, okay. uh, oh, sorry, my, gra my graduate degree was in government politics. My undergraduate degree was in history. Um, and I actually did some of my graduate research actually on the Rome campus, which was wonderful. Oh, okay, nice. And then you can see also Doug's dad, who had the pleasure of meeting when I first started at St. John's. Um, your dad was a professor of biology, correct? Yeah, and he did his own study abroad programs from time to time, especially to uh, Bermuda. Right. To yeah, Bermuda. So, yeah, yeah exactly. that's so. nice. I always was trying to try to, to put together a trip 
and then he retired on me. So we weren't <laughs> able to do that. And how many years did your dad teach? A long time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I think it was well over 25, 30 years at this point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Easily. He, joined, he joined the university in the 1970s. So yeah, it, it was, it was a really long tenure, but he absolutely enjoyed it. He always said that he was being paid to do his hobby. Um, and it was a real <laughs> part of his vocation. So, um, oh, that's yeah, nice. definitely. Yeah, uh, actually, he was a he was a professor when I was going to school, so I always remembered the name. Yeah. But Doug is a faculty director for the Rome Immersion and Global Engagement Coordinator for the Office of International Education at St. John's University. It's a mouthful. So with that, I don't want to take because I know you have plenty of material to <laughs> share with us. You're going to love his photos and, and all of that great stuff. So I'm going to turn the computer screen over to you, Doug. Thank you so much. Sounds good. I'm so, just going to turn off my video and audio. So this way sure. there's no interruption. Sure. And you can see the slide. I can. Okay, beautiful. But you just need to enlarge it. You need to maximize the screen. Is that better? Uh, can you do a little bit? Because I remember, yeah, that's perfect. Great, thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, there's gonna be a lot of slides here, but I'm gonna go through as many as I can. Um, I uh, had a lot of joy putting this together. Um, and so anything that uh, we miss, we can do as part of the next virtual tour. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this kind of global version of the Power Hour. So. Um, we're going to go through central Italy and talk about the different regions in central Italy. And I would like to talk about, um, the tourism industry, but also the culture, the food, um, and things that are maybe more off the beaten track. And then also things that are, um, ways to kind of avoid some of the tourists sometimes when tourism does kick back up in Italy. So the 1st region I'll be going through is the region of Tuscany. Um, and for each of these, I'm not going to be talking about sometimes the major sites. And if I do, I'll talk about it in a different way than you might expect. Um, and through this, hopefully you get a sense of the diversity and interesting aspects of this part of central Italy. So the region of, of Tuscany um, is situated on the, the western coast of the country. It is mountainous and hilly in the eastern end and the northern end. Um, and also, it's a place that is full of um, tourist sites, um, sometimes almost too much. Uh, this feels like it's from a bygone era with all the social distancing that's going on. But uh, what I'm going to talk about during this talk is not just the more, port, uh, more important tourist sites, um, but also the ones that are kind of being overlooked. And it may, might be odd in this scenario to start off with a place like Pisa. Um, Pisa uh, is a place that is sometimes overrun with tourists, especially around the, leaning, the famous Leaning Tower during the day. Um, it's a city that is absolutely gorgeous, and it might be strange to say, but it's actually one of my favorite cities in Italy. And the Leaning Tower of Pisa is probably 10th on that list of why I love the city. Um, one of the things I think is really fascinating about Pisa that a lot of people miss out on is Pisa after dark. So Pisa is a huge college town. The university was founded during the late Middle Ages there, and there's a huge university community, which is really cool. But also because of all the people that come there during the day, it really kind of empties out during the night or even the late afternoon. The average vis visit to Pisa only lasts maybe an hour and a half for the typical tourist because they're just going from the train station, seeing the Lean Tower, and then getting back on. Um, but what's really cool about the city after night is there's all these restaurants, music venues, things that are really active in the city that open up and you'll be surrounded by a lot of locals, which is almost the opposite of what it is during the day. And the Arno River that flows through the city is the same one that actually flows through the city of Florence. And there's all these really cool activities that happen during the night. They all have musical concerts along the riverfront. Um, they have art galleries that are open. And this is part of the talk that I want to uh, kind of speak about in which um, a city sometimes gets uh, defined by its postcard picture, but there's so much layers underneath. So if I was visiting Pisa, I would actually get there on the train around 3 or 4 p.m. in the afternoon and then stay the night and then leave the next morning to kind of get a sense of how it is after dark. Right next to Pisa is the city of Lucca. And just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about when in terms of these two cities, the city of Lucca has these amazing medieval transformations to it. So this uh, Piazza today, uh, you can kind of notice its oval shape actually used to be a um, Colosseum, a ancient Roman amphitheater. You can kind of see it by its shape and you can see it by its curved walls. This is one of the central piazzas uh, in the city of Lucca, which is just north of Pisa in northern Tuscany. 
A big part of why I love this part of Italy is the really easily accessible trails. And so whether you want to go for a mile walk or an all day or multi day hike, there's some amazing opportunities. Um, and what's really cool about especially this hike from Luca to Pisa, which could be an all day hike if you want to do it, is that the entire hike is lined with aqueducts, these ancient Roman aqueducts that actually still work. So you can see on this image that I took during one of my hikes, there was actually uh, an older gentleman, older Italian filling up his water for the week from these aqueducts. Um, and these hikes are really all accessible and the app that I would definitely recommend you check out for the United States hiking, but as well as in Europe is called All Trails, A-L-L, -L, Trails. Um, what's really cool about that app is you can actually um, download things offline um, and download maps offline. So even if you do not have an internet connection, you can still navigate through hills, valleys, wherever you wanna go, or even if it's a quick you know, mile stroll through a town. Siena is a really famous town in the center of um, Tuscany. Um, it, it was a rival for, of Florence during the late Middle Ages. And what's really cool about Siena is um, the way in which the history has been preserved over the millennia. So this is its main town square. I would definitely recommend if you're going to a place like Siena, just like Pisa, that you do this as an overnight trip, because especially during the hours of basically of 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., the central, the central piazza is absolutely uh, clog sometimes with tourists, um, which is kind of difficult to imagine during these social distancing times. But Siena is also really famous because of its local identity as a result of the Palio, which is a horse race uh, which takes place during the months of July and August. Um, these horse races actually um, are really taking uh, a page from uh, medieval kind of neighborhood identity. So each um, horse and each rider actually is identified by a sigil, which represents a neighborhood. And this is a really important part of when we're talking about Italy is to not kind of label it as some kind of monoculture, but there's all these really intricate cultural identities that are happening in each region. And then also within those region, each provinces, cities, and even down to the neighborhood level. I also want to mention that we're, we're thinking about maybe for a future Globetrotters uh, tour, there's the possibility, Susan was mentioning, that in the future, that if people want to, um, she might have a connection to get a balcony seat, I heard, uh, which would be really cool um, for one of these events. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so you don't have to be with the mob at the, in, in, the, in the base, because I know that's no. pretty crowded. <laughs> It of course comes with a uh, a nice uh, fee, but it would probably be worth the experience, I'm sure. Yeah. So uh, one of the big parts of Tuscany is its cuisine, but also its wine. And I'll just use one example to kind of talk about the fields around Siena, then also Multipliciano, is the Sangiovese wine. Um, many of you have had this wine before, you had this grape, um, but just to show you the lineage and the history of this area, Sangiovese is actually comes from uh, the ancient Latin. It's actually, if you break it apart, it comes into two words, sangue and Jovese, which actually, if you know some of your Latin, that means the blood of Jupiter, Jupiter being the ancient Roman god. And so um, you kind of, just using that as an example, you kind of get a sense of the history of this land. Uh, this is actually a funeral uh, monument in an underground tomb uh, to a to the ancient Etruscans that were uh, in this area even before the ancient Romans. Um, and actually, it should be said that some of the ancient Roman, ancient um, Etruscan wine, some of the ABV or alcohol by volume actually approached sometimes the um, alcohol of whiskey. Um, so around 40, 45%. So what the Romans did it, to not be absolutely gluttonous was actually mix it with water and different types of herbs to kind of water it down, which is kind of interesting. So, 1 of the things I want to talk about, especially with uh, Tuscany is its coast. Um, of course, everyone, when they think about Tuscany, they think about Florence, they think about Siena, those hill towns. But I always tell uh, students as well as people who are visiting Italy that the coastline of Italy extends beyond the Amalfi coast. And there's some beautiful coastline to explore from Mar Mar Monte Argentario, which is this beautiful peninsula that sticks out into the Mediterranean with these really beautiful towns that um, really do get kind of um, under tour, uh, under visited in some senses. Um, and the beaches there in Monte Argentario are absolutely beautiful and very secluded. If you're interested in doing really connecting with nature, I always recommend people to uh, when they're planning a vacation that they plan a nature portion towards the end so they get to relax and kind of decompress before returning to your working life. 
And then Elba, which um, this is the town of Port, uh, Porta Fario in Elba, which is actually a main um, kind of luxury cruise ship destination, um, has been kind of under uh, represented in terms of tourism, not because of this town, but what lies beyond it. A lot of people who visit Elba just end up in this town, kind of visit the town itself. But there's some beautiful beaches if you kind of extend yourself into the town, uh, into the island of Elba. Elba is famous, most famous for um, being the place where uh, Napoleon was actually exiled uh, during his first defeat, during his first exile. Uh, and he couldn't stand the island because he wanted to get back off of it but um, and kind of get back into power. But once you're there, you can never understand why Napoleon would ever want to leave this place. It's absolutely uh, gorgeous. And large parts of the island are actually um, kind of retain their old kind of like post-World War II um rustic feel where you kind of have uh these old fishing villages that still exist which is beautiful umbria which is sometimes called the new tuscany depending on how uh it's being labeled is the region that's kind of east of um of, of tuscany itself it's a very mountainous and green region and it's been called kind of the green heart of italy so uh this part of um of the country is mountainous hilly but also has a ton of output in terms of agriculture uh, many of you know a central town in this area called Assisi, uh, which is famous for the um, uh, the monastery, but also the Basilica of St. Francis, which has these absolutely beautiful mosaics, which uh, you can go see. Some of them are very famous. You may have seen these in your textbooks growing up of St. Francis talking uh, and preaching to the birds. Um, one thing I want to talk about with the town of Assisi, which is kind of cool, that doesn't get as much um, uh, press as the Camino de Santiago. For those who do not, not, not know, the Camino de Santiago is a big pilgrimage trail that ends in Spain. Uh, what's really cool about Assisi is from the town of Assisi, which is surrounded by vineyards and olive groves, is the Camino de Francesco, or the Way of St. Francis. And they break up this up into different sections. So if you're interested in nature strolls from the town of Assisi, um, to kind of get away from tourists and get into nature. Um, this trail where you can walk the way of St. Francis extends all the way from Florence all the way to Rome. Uh, of course, you don't have to walk that entire length if you don't want to, but they even break it up into manageable sections. So even if you want, you know, a couple miles stroll through um, nature, it's a beautiful thing to explore. And while you're walking through this trail, you can be walking through beautiful olive groves uh, and these kind of really awesome parts of uh, Umbria where you can really see this hilly nature and hilly terrain of this um, region. Uh, the town of or or Orvieto, which lies to the south in Umbria, is another really great town that I've been taking students to for a while. Um, it, it sits on a two-foot block of volcanic stone above a, a valley of vineyards. And what's really cool about the town is even if you're not that into, or not even if you are kind of ge uh, geographically um, uh, challenge sometimes in terms of getting lost and walking. What's really great about this town is you can't get lost because everything is on a plateau. So there's no way you can uh, really get too lost uh, in this town. But what's beautiful about um, uh, this town of Orvieto is besides its setting, uh, the art in the Duomo di Orvieto is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, inside, you have the frescoes of Signorelli, which um, was a forerunner to Michelangelo. Actually, Michelangelo studied Signorelli's works when he was designing uh, the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So you can really get a sense of the history there. And then also, the, what's really cool about the town, speaking, we talked earlier about wine, is the entire town, because it's built on this volcanic stone, people have built their own wine cellars into the actual cliffs uh, and actually wells as well. Pozzo della Cava is an example of that within. Um, or Vieto. And then there's all these really cool towers. Um, for those uh, that wish, actually, some of these towers actually come with um, elevators that can take you up half the way if you wish. Uh, Torre del Moro is an example of that tower, which offers amazing views of the surrounding countryside. And then I think what's really cool about Orvieto is um, how the town just absolutely gets lit up after, after dark. Um, Orvieto is one of the towns that has some tourists during the day, but in the evening, it kind of empties out a bit. And it's also really cool to be in a city or in a town that is the center of a huge culinary tradition. Um, so what I mean by this is there's several culinary institutes that people from all over Italy and all over the world actually go to Orvieto to learn how to cook different uh, cuisines. Um, and so what's really cool about the restaurants there is sometimes you have younger chefs that are experimenting with things, but also leaning on old traditional recipes. 
Uh, of course, I can't leave Umbria without talking about truffles and truffle season, especially in the fall to winter seasons. Um, you can get black and white truffles, uh, and that's a big staple of uh, part of the cuisine there. Um, but there's also amazing uh, uh, amounts of different vegetables, legumes, uh, meats that you can try as well. This is kind so, of like a, oh, sorry. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but it's funny you should say that because one of my memories of Orvieto was just a simple, simple meal. And I find this, you know, always amazing with Italy. It was just fresh tomatoes, you know, mozzarella, and then on just this beautiful, no, it didn't have mozzarella. It was just fresh tomatoes, basil, this delicious crusty bread with this amazing olive oil just drizzled. And it was a snack and still to this day, we're talking, this is many years ago. I still remember that meal as plain as it was, but each, you know, ingredient was just so pure and fresh. And, uh, that's what, that's what I love about Tuscany, the food and, mm -hmm. and everything. It just makes it so memorable. It's really yeah. nice. A lot of Italian cuisine in general is less is more where, um, yeah. th that whole philosophy. So yeah, it's really cool. You're making me hungry. <laughs> <Just for you. laughs> um, so, uh, Lazio is the next region I'll just touch upon. Lazio is probably one of the most, uh, underrated regions of Italy in my mind. It's 1 of my favorite favorite regions. Um, if you do not know, Lazio is the region that contains the city of Rome, but so much more. Because Rome gets so much of the attention. A lot of people, when they visit Rome, don't really want to venture to, to, uh, the places within Lazio, they say, oh, I want to go to Tuscany. I want to go to Milan. I want to go to different places. Um, Susan, you mentioned during um, your trip with the, uh, with the donors, you guys visited a, um, a vineyard in Lazio, which was absolutely gorgeous. And you had some really wonderful food, right? Yes, that was really fun. And I didn't expect uh, to see, you know, this great vineyard and the wine to be so fantastic, but it was really very, very good. Excellent. Yeah. So the region of Lazio um, is again along the western coast of Italy um, and has some mountains to the east, um, lakes to the south and the north. Um, what's really cool about this region um, is its history, especially with the Catholic Church. Um, so the Terbo, I think, is one of the most underrepresented uh, towns that people can go to in Italy. It has amazing history. For a time being, actually, some of the popes were actually stationed in Viterbo instead of Rome. And so, because of that, um, the interiors of the palaces in Viterbo were designed by the same um, artist that designed the corridors of um, the Vatican Museums. The catch is, you can go into Viterbo's palaces for free because they're their current city halls. So, you have these lined walls with beautiful frescoes uh, because it used to be a part where the popes would visit uh, during the summer months, but also um, for some years, depending on you know, the violence in medieval Rome. Uh, but it's an absolute beautiful city to experience because of that. Um, and then also what's really cool is right next door is Villa Lante, right outside of Viterbo, which um, is a beautiful vi uh, villa built by a um, Renaissance cardinal. Uh, and what's really cool about this villa is that if you've ever seen any movie that is set in the Vatican Gardens, that generally is not the Vatican Gardens. You can't really film movies in the Vatican Gardens. So repeatedly, Villa Lante is used as a substitute for the Vatican Gardens because it was designed by a, a Vatican Cardinal. And it has these beautiful fountains and places to wander through nature. Um, and it's a really uh, amazing place. What's also really cool about Villa Lante is because it's so kind of unvisited by the general tourist population, um, students can get in there for free if they show their student cards. So can some faculty, if you have your faculty card, um, and then even uh, senior citizens, as well as the general public, it's really cheap. Sometimes I think the most expensive ticket to get into Villa Lante is like two or four euros. So it's absolutely wonderful. And I can't leave this region, uh, this part of Northern Lazio uh, without talking about chestnuts and hazelnuts and all different types of nuts. These, uh, this part of um, Lazio has a lot of these wooded fields, um, which really produce amazing chestnuts, hazelnuts, so a lot of the towns including the Terbo and a lot of towns around that area have these chestnut festivals during the fall, uh, which they go all out. They have Renaissance fairs, they have all these different types of things. So um, if you're into any types of uh, nuts, um, that's a great time to go, especially during the fall season from basically September, October, even into December. And then uh, for those 
who really want to explore some volcanic lakes, um, Nemi is absolutely gorgeous. This is now going south of Rome uh, and it's situated on this beautiful uh, volcanic lake. Um, there's a lot of volcanic lakes around Rome. This is where Rome gets its beautiful kind of uh, 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 crystal clear drinking water. There's a lot of volcanoes in Rome in the uh, in uh, kind of the prehistoric era that imploded. Uh, and these imploded volcanoes created these huge uh, ponds or lakes that were filled with spring water. And so the town of Nemi is famous for this, as well as the nearby town as well, uh, um, next to Castle Gondolfo, which is where this Pope summer residence is. Um, the part of the cuisine around this area, especially in southern Lazio, you might have heard before, which is porchetta, which is a whole roasted uh, spit, uh, spitfire pig, uh, stuffed with different herbs, which is absolutely delicious, especially if you're going on one of these hikes or nature walks. It's a great way to get those calories in. But then also a big part of Nemi, if you love strawberries, you have to go to Nemi, um, uh, which is situated on that lake. It is one of the capitals of Italy or capitals of the world of strawberry production, but also in terms of berry production. So even to this day, they have these uh, wonderful festivals um, that celebrate the strawberry and also a ton of different berries. So if you're into blueberries, um, cherries, um, different types of blackberries, um, this town is really known for it. So they make different types of strawberry daiquiris. They make different types of strawberry liqueur, uh, desserts, um, amazing opportunities for you to explore. And then um, a ta uh, an island off the coast of Lazio that I think gets kind of um, overlooked because it's kind of uh, close to the beautiful uh, island of Capri. And in my mind, Ponza is just as beautiful. Um, so Ponza is uh, located south in southwestern Lazio, right off the coast of Lazio. And it was this historic fishing village uh, for many years. Um, some tourists have been visiting there recently, but not nearly the same amount as its southern neighbor of Capri. Um, so this fishing village is beautiful because um, you can situate yourselves in different towns along the coast. And then uh, there's also these beautiful trails that connect all the towns and different vineyards are actually dotted there as well. This is kind of a sunset in the island of Capri, or sorry, island of Panza. And then finally, I'll be finishing up in Marque, and this is where I have a special treat for Susan coming up. Um, hey, that's my hometown. <laughs> exactly. So uh, Marque, I think, is uh, an absolutely gorgeous reg region. Um, it's been actually in uh, included a lot of tourist uh, itineraries more and more now. So kind of like just like gentrification, sometimes tourism has this little domino effect where people say, oh, Tuscany is too popular. Let me go to Umbria. Oh, Umbria is getting more popular. Let me go to Marque. So if this makes any sense, Marque is the new Umbria as Umbria is the new Tuscany in terms of the tourist mindset. Um, but it definitely has had um, its, its share of, um, you know, issues in the past regarding, especially in the southern section, southwestern section, um, earthquakes. So some devastating earthquakes have affected some of its southern towns. But it's an absolutely gorgeous region. Um, I know this firsthand uh, because some of my family um, uh, one of my uncles actually has a farmhouse there. Um, the town of Urbino, which um, is an absolutely gorgeous Renaissance town, um, is it in the northern part of Marque, which um, I visited. The Palazzo Ducale is absolutely wonderful. Um, it's a Renaissance uh, style uh, um, palace, which you can explore all these different rooms. And then also Duomo di uh, Urbino, its main uh, Duomo is absolutely beautifully set. The entire historic center of Urbino in general is uh, really wonderfully um, preserved, um, which is absolutely fantastic. And then one of the things that when I visited my uncle um, in Marque to visit his farm, one thing I noticed is if you like sunflowers or just flowers in general, please, for the love of God, go to Marque. The, especially in Southern Marque, the entire region is covered in sunflower fields, as far as the eye can see. You, you feel like you've seen enough sunflowers and you turn your, turn your, uh, your eyes to the right and you see even more. Um, and then also you see in these pictures, the rolling fields, and there's a lot of really awesome agriculture happening in this area. Um, this is actually a picture of my uh, uncle's farmhouse in Marque, which sits below the town of Monte Rinaldo. Uh, this area, um, of Marque in Southern Marque um, is really beautiful because you have all these tiny little villages that are um, spaced out by these kind of huge vineyards, um, different types of uh, groves for growing, different types of vegetables. Um, 
And this is the town from uh, the view from Monte Rinaldo, where uh, part of my family is from. So it's a really uh, wonderful place to explore, especially if you want to have some very easy driving conditions where there, you don't want to be around any traffic um, and just around nature. Um, the bus situations or the transit connections in this area are not as enhanced as in Tuscany or Umbria um, because they haven't had like the influx of tourism yet. Um, they do have some bus connections, um, but uh, the car is the best way to definitely get around. And one thing I'd re definitely recommend, especially in Marche or different areas of Italy, is to really, if you have the time, check out agriturismos, which are these farmhouses, which uh, take in visitors and show off their local um, uh, crafts and local uh, agriculture. Um, and a lot of times people associate agriturismos with wine cultivation, but it could be go beyond that. As I said before, I, I visited our, uh, agriturismo in Lazio, which was actually they were growing chestnuts. Um, when I was in northern Italy around the Dolomites, I went to a, a honey agriturismo. They were uh, cultivating honey. So all these different parts of Italy have you can really show off their local agriculture uh, beyond beyond wine production. And as you kind of venture through uh, Marche, you see these little villages, which are absolutely gorgeously set. And then in the distance, because we're towards the east coast of, um, of Italy, you come to the town of San Benedetto del Tronto, uh, which uh, Susan should know. So, Susan, what is the connection with this I town? I know it very well. That's where my, my grandfather was born and raised. Uh, actually, there's a town, uh, there's a street that's named after one of my great, great uncles. There's a lot of Damiani's in San Benedetto del Tronto. And then from there, they all went to Chicago. But what I love about it is when my, when I first visited uh, San Benedetto, uh, it felt like you were in the 1950s because along, as you can see, along the shoreline were all these tiny um, beach clubs. And the way they were decorated and, and so forth and the chairs and so colorful with the umbrellas, it reminded me of, you know, the beach clubs back in like the 50s and 60s, very retro. Uh, but I was so surprised because I just of all the palm trees and everything. But what what you mentioned, what's nice about the Marquee region is you can enjoy the seaside villages, but then you also have the mountains. So you have the best of both worlds. So it really is is a beautiful place to visit, but especially in the time, it is so much fun. The fish, everything is so fresh. It's terrific. Um, so, so my uncle's farm is about maybe a 50, 60 minute drive away from San Benedetto. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really, again, I'm just emphasizing this, um, that a lot of times, I mean, I'm not, nothing against the Amalfi Coast. It's a beautifully gorgeous part of Italy, but Italy is surrounded by coastline and sometimes tourists don't realize that. So there's That's all these true. amazing places you can visit that um, uh, you can really, if you really love the water, if you really want to get some fresh sea air, um, there's some really beautiful places to explore. Um, so I mean, back in the early 90s, uh, or even earlier than that, when my sister was the first person to go visit the family over there, they really didn't have the highway. So she had to go take a uh, drive through the mountains, which was just, you know, circular, you know, roads. Uh, but now with the highway, it's really very close to Rome. It is, yes. So it's, um, it's, and, an easy, it's an easy drive. So I didn't um, have a car when I was in Marque because uh, once I got to my uncle, he had a car. Um, but uh, one of the cool things that they just set up recently in Rome is this bus called Rome to Marque. Um, which is a dedicated bus line to connect people from Rome to this region. And it's actually pretty cheap. It's about like oh, five or great. 10 bucks. Uh, and the quality of the bus, it's, it's no Greyhound or Peter Pan. It's actually <laughs> has some really beautifully upgraded uh, amenities. So I had also, it's really great to ride on a bus through these mountainous regions with the huge windows they have because you can really take in all the scenery. So, and uh, it, it's, it's destination when you go from Rome, the first stop is San Benedetto. So. It's pretty cool to kind of be welcomed with this. I so, didn't know we were Pisanos. You're uh, yeah. Marca John. Then yeah. you're Marca John, right? <laughs> yeah. When growing up, no one knew what Marca John was. It was either you're Sicilian or Nabaladan or, you know, uh, Calabrese. And I used to go back to my grandmother. Grandma, are you sure we're Italian? Because no one believes that I'm Italian. They never heard of Marca John, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 
So the, the last part I'm going to talk about um, before I open up for Q&A is um, just talking about San Benedetto. One of the coolest kind of art projects I've ever seen was actually in this town. So if you notice, I'm using this aerial view of the town because it has these large piers, which historically, of course, have been used for its big shipping industry, but also its fishing industry. So a lot of fishermen would come in and out and needed a way to protect the harbor. Um, but what's cool about it today is in the past, these piers were just used by fishermen, right? They were for just industrial activities for fishing. Um, but now they turned it into an art project uh, because a lot of the rocks that line this are these kind of limestone rocks that are very easy to carve. And so this is kind of the view from one of these piers of the countryside, which is really beautiful. But then along the pier, uh, you have the Scultura Viva, which is basically this living sculpture garden um, depicting the fishermen and the people of this town of San Benedetto. So uh, each of these are really beautifully intricately carved um, where you can see kind of the details in the face. And you can see how they're that limestone kind of quality where you have the kind of the layers of the stone uh, presented. Um, and uh, they kind of incorporate nautical themes. So you can see this um, incorporating kind of the themes of a fishing net being held up by these two people. And this is kind of a zoomed in picture of one of the, these uh, statues um, along the pier. And again, um, I could talk forever about this pier because every few feet you have another statue and other groupings of statues that have been presented. Um, so this is a local fisherman that was uh, depicted in these statues. And this is actually the carving uh, to kind of show you uh, so they use, uh, if you see this uh, uh, in his tools kit, you see a combination of the power tools in terms of the chisel, but then the old kind of um, hammer and chisel um, old school method when they want to get some more detail in. Um, so it's really cool how this kind of um, art uh, artisan tradition has took on this new life and breathe uh, breathe life into this kind of uh, really cool pier and made it into an art installation. And then while you're in Marque, of course, in the interior, you have a lot of the staple foods of pastas and uh, different types of uh, meats and cheeses. But then along the coastline, what's cool about Marque, it completely shifts where you have uh, seafood dishes uh, like Rondetto de la Marque, which is basically uh, a fisherman's pot of all the things that are coming from the seaside. So things like mussels, clams, calamari, all thrown together in a big pot uh, with a, a tomato, a really beautiful uh, tomato sauce. Um, so uh, with that being said, I um, want to say grazie to everyone who attended and um, I'm going to open up for questions now or any comments or things. Uh, this is going to be the first part of a three part series. So we're going to have the next part on Southern Italy and then Northern Italy. So thank you. Grazie tante. <laughs> One I would like to add another uh, dish or, or delicacy that they have is stuffed olives. They stuff the olives and then they bread it and it's delicious. Really, really good. Does anyone have any questions for Doug? Gave us a lot of information. Lynn says, thanks for the great talks and fantastic photos. Yes, the photos were beautiful. Who took the photos for you? So uh, th that was a combination. So some of them were my own photos. Um, some of them were student contributions. And then, um, of course, we don't have aerial shots. I don't, I can't. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a crane or a, so for, for those two, um, for those two uh, places, um, uh, for those, for those pictures, I got those from uh, Pixabay, which is, uh, oh, which beautiful. is great. Yeah, I nice. think actually, yeah, so that's great. Uh, Kevin, to know wh wh what's your favorite place to visit? It changes by the year. So mm -hmm. when I discover something new, I fall in love with it. And, <laughs> and um, I would say the top of my mind is Rome, just because I have such a history uh, um, of it. Um, it was the first time when I was traveling abroad uh, with St. John's. It was the first time I visited um, a, for, a, a place. It was one of my first times actually on a plane. Um, mm -hmm. And that, 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 that city has so many layers to it beyond even the ancient and medieval and Baroque layers. I mean, uh, Susan knows this. I took her to a farmer's market on the outskirts of the city in Garbatella, a that place that it, and you had the street art and stuff like that. Yes. It, it was, it was something that you would never think uh, of when you're going to Rome. And mm -hmm. it was really cool to talk to the local vendors and things like that. Um, I mean, for now, yeah, uh, it's been Rome, but um, every single region has its own qualities. I feel like um, in trying to I, get I agree with you. You know, each one is unique, and it's, but I, I'm big with Rome. I love that's one of my favorite cities in, in Italy. 
Uh, we have another question here. What is the best time to visit and how long should you plan for a visit? Well, I could stay forever, but yeah, you so, answer that question. So, <laughs> so how long should you plan for a visit? All depends on your own schedule. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that if you have a week, even a week, that's great. Mm -hmm. I'm a big advocate of um, getting to know one place instead of hopping around. So let's say you have a, a week of vacation time set aside. I would rather get to know even one or two or three towns or even two places than try to do Venice in a day, Rome in a day, Florence in a day. That would just stress me out. I know everyone's different. So I would say one to two weeks is perfect if you can afford that. I know Americans, sometimes we have the shortest vacation time in the known world <laughs> with all this stuff. But sure. um, And then what's the best time to visit? This is my own personal opinion. I love the fall. The fall is sure. a beautiful time to visit. I would say September to October are my favorite times to visit Italy, bar none. Why? You have the, the festival seasons coming into effect, the harvest seasons. I was mentioning about the chestnuts and things like that and all these different festivals. The weather is gorgeous. So what you have is you have the dryness of summer, but without the heat. So and also in September, oddly enough, you can still go to the beaches and swim yes. in the water because mm -hmm. the water temperature, of course, heats up slower than the air temperature. So by September, we had our students when we went down to a place like Puglia in the south of Italy, our students were still, you know, uh, dipping their toes in the water to ex experience that where <laughs> in New York beaches, you couldn't do that as much in like maybe you could do that depending on the weather. But um, it, yeah, so fall September and October is my favorite time to go. Um, but every every season has its certain advantages and dis disadvantages, depending on uh, what you're looking at. I agree when we uh, when the Globetrotters went. In October, I mean, remember our weather was beautiful. It was really spectacular. But April, April's nice as well. I yeah, used so to travel a lot. Well, it's not. It's quiet. It's a little on the quieter side. Um, and the and the weather is 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 uh, mild, so it's very nice too. Well, we have lots of questions coming in here. Okay, uh, let's see the next one. For those that have not had an opportunity to visit Italy. What should I go first? Mm, that's a tough so question. So my answer to this is I a phrase I use with my own students. I say translate your passion. So what I mean by translate your passion is whatever you're interested in, try to find a way to translate that to Italy. Everyone, and you know this, Susan, when we travel with the donors, yes. everyone has their own interest. So mm -hmm. think about the things that you really want to experience, out, out, uh, not even think about Italy, whether it's fashion, food, um, music, um, and then align things based upon that. Um, I would say, like, my first time in Italy, I would say Rome's a good home base because you don't have to connect to uh, different airports and things like that. It's a direct flight in. Um, I would say, especially if you're going with a family um, and going to, uh, I, I would say, mixing up something where you are in smaller towns or villages because a, a, with a big family, a city can get it kind of chaotic. I would say, because uh, I know Sue answered this question, Sue, I would say my favorite place, if you're taking a two to three year old, because I know Sue ha as a young kid, mm -hmm. um, is Luca. Luca is a really cool town because it's a it's a medieval town in Italy, but it's completely flat. So if you have a stroll, <laughs> you, there's, there's no hills whatsoever, and it's surrounded by a beautiful medieval wall, which is now a park, which is completely flat as well. Um, and you can rent bikes and you can even now, I think, rent tricycles. So if you have a kid who's just learning to bike, I think that's a really cool first experience in Italy um, for the ki for a kid. And especially for, you know, young mothers, um, that's a really cool thing to do. Thanks, Doug. That's great. That's great. How is it to travel to Alba for the truck festival? So, okay, so I would say Alba Yes, they have a famous truffle festival, but one thing I want to mention with this is that sometimes there's a feedback loop when it comes to tourism. And what I mean by that is that people hear about truffles and Alba and they keep on going there. Um, I, I do like the truffle festival in Alba. Uh, my point in all of this is that truffles don't just exist just in Alba. There's other towns that also <laughs> have the truffle festivals, and I can link to that in the email as a follow up kind of just here are the different truffle towns. That would be great. Um, but yeah, so yeah, Alba is absolutely a, a kind of, if those who don't know, Alba is a beautiful town in uh, Piedmont um, and it's famous for its truffle. Piedmont is also, the reason why Alba is on the map a lot of times with this is because Piedmont in general is the center of what is called the slow food movement. 
So the slow food movement is basically extra organic. So not even eating organic food, but also eating food that's locally produced within basically one or two kilometers of your town, but also um, not eating fast food and eating kind of locally sourced food. So Piedmont, a lot of the towns in Piedmont started this movement. And so because of this, a lot of the festival food festivals um, that gain international recognition are based around either Tuscany or Piedmont. Um, but yeah, no, definitely go to Alba. Um, I would say uh, it's a beautiful town to visit, but there's also there's other towns and I can link to that in the follow up email. That's great. Uh, I don't have any questions, but I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation and lots of information. That's a compliment that is coming from a true Italian. Josephine, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Rob is saying February with exclamation point. So I, I think it's like when to visit. Um, so I would say February is a great time to visit if you want to completely avoid the tourist crowds, especially if you're going to places like Rome. Uh, the Vatican true. museums are completely packed in a lot of other parts of the month. Um, so if you go to February, especially in February, you're in the middle of opera season and music season. Um, and so if you're really into that, those kind of like uh, indoor concerts and museums, it's a great time to go. Um, cause I can understand the summer gets a little hot. Well, even the winters are milder than at home. Correct. In, in Rome, the winters yeah. aren't as cold. In it's, Rome. Not, it's not as cold. Tuscany so is cold. I've been to Tuscany in January. Do not recommend it. It was biting, chilly, bone chilling, cold. Yeah. It was crazy. So yeah. I, I always like to see, especially during the fall semester, even the spring semester, when we bring our students over to Rome, um, of course, during the colder months, they're bringing the winter coats. But it's interesting to see how much more wrapped up the Italians are compared to the <laughs> Americans, because to them, 45 degrees is, oh, my gosh, it's this cold. is biting cold. Right. You know? uh, and so, yeah, that, that's a good point. Alan was saying something in uh, Christmas time, Ascoli and snow covered mountains between Rome and Ascoli, the festival and the Adriatic coast. He was uh, remarking. Do you know anything about that? Oh, yeah, Ascoli. Yeah. Are, um, so um, if you're talking about Ascoli, uh, yeah. yeah, so that's a beautiful town. Um, mm -hmm. Again, with all these tours, I didn't want to give too much information, but. Right. That's um, right near San Benedetto. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and that's tiny town. That's a yeah, but it ha, it's it's it has this great kind of like uh, for how small it is, it has an amazing collection of Renaissance art, especially in the churches there. Um, they also have these really cool festivals that I went to, um, especially during and again that fall season that you can check out. Um, but that's a really uh, I was actually that's odd, that that's interesting that he brought that up because that was one of the towns I was thinking about adding to the slides, and I was like, I think I have too much information. So, but yeah, it's definitely. It's a cute little town. Yeah, definitely. In fact, I don't know if Sue can unmute. We have Marilyn Werner uh, with us today. And Marilyn and I, after the Globetrotter uh, tour, we took a drive through the Marque region. And Marilyn does a lot of genealogy. Marilyn, are you with us online? Sue, is Marilyn with us? Sue, is on, you have to unmute yourself, Sue. Yes, I, I just unmuted okay, Marilyn. Sorry, sorry. I just unmuted Marilyn. Marilyn, hi. Do you want to contribute? Because I know you know so much and you know a lot because you're you're like me. You're well, you're a uh, you're Marke, Marke John. And, uh, I'm no, actually our family is from Abruzzo. And sorry, yes, Abruzzo, sorry. Right. And we went to the little town of Fada San Martino. In the rain, yes. <laughs> unfortunately, <Yes. laughs> um, it's just beautiful. The mountains are lovely, and um, I hope he speaks about Abruzzo and Molise when in the next uh, session, because it really is pretty. <laughs> it's underdeveloped. Uh, it is. It was tourists. beautiful. Yeah, and Marilyn took little teeny teeny towns. And uh, it was quite a challenge because I was driving and we got yeah. to the top of the hill and no one was around. And then all of a sudden there was this great gathering of people and all the cars were starting to come to the top of the mountain. And I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get down the mountain? So yeah, Marilyn challenged my driving skills, but thank you because I feel like I it was quite an accomplishment. <laughs> yeah, very good. And actually, they were having a renewal of their vows, their 50th anniversary. So the, that little piazza in front of the church was so crowded. 
It really was, yeah. yeah but that's really the beauty of, you know, you just get in the car and you drive right. through a lot of these uh, small towns, right, Doug? I mean, that's yeah, the beauty it's... of, of yeah, Italy yeah. as well. And, uh, Thanks, Marilyn. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Marilyn. Yeah, and uh, uh, Abruzzo is a town, a place or a um, region that I was going to include in this talk, but then uh, it, the, the slides got too much. Because uh, it's interesting, <laughs> Abruzzo, yes, it's technically in some formats part of southern Italy because of its region. But if you go to east western Abruzzo to places like Tagliacozzo that are along kind of the Lazio border, they have more in common with Lazio than they do with southern right. Italy. Yeah. So it's an interesting transition. Um, yeah, so we'll definitely be talking about that during the next talk. Um, there's a question about the St. John's uh, Rome, uh, St. John's campus in Rome. Um, how long do students stay? So the St. John's campus um, has around 200 uh, uh, 200 beds. Um, it's located in the neighborhood of Prati, which is kind of like the Upper East Side of Rome. It, as Susan was saying, it's really close to the St. John's, uh, sorry, to the um, the Vatican Museum, uh, and within the 20 15 minute walk away from the historic center. So it's really centrally located. Um, we've been at St. John's uh, in Rome since 1995. Um, how long do students stay? There's a whole very, very uh, variety of programs. For freshman students who want to get a little taste of Italy during their freshman year, we offer the Global Passport Program, which is a one-week program where they stay on the Rome campus during that one week and explore the city with a New York uh, faculty member. They can also do short-term programs, which can range from anywhere from four to eight uh, weeks. So those are maybe during the summer session or the winter session. And then students can actually spend an entire semester there if they wish, um, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, my students last semester in the fall absolutely loved that when they did it in the fall semester because they can see the transition of, of Rome from summertime all the way to Christmas time. And at the very end, Piazza Navona is being decked out with lights and creches and things like that. So that's really cool. Nice. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen, for asking that question. Um, I was going to close with that information. But if you are ever traveling through Rome or wanted to go to Italy, now you know Professor Catelmo. So now you have your your Italian uh, guide, uh, and he can give you all the information. I know there's another question: if you a list of festivals, is yeah. there a site to go to? Yeah. So um, there's sites in English, and then there's also ones in Italian. So I think. Um, there's, uh, I, I can send a list for both in the follow up email to this. Um, the easiest layout of like the most condensed list of festivals, it comes from Rick Steves, which many of you may know. From yes, from Channel 13. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want a little bit more detail, um, there's ones that actually uh, do, uh, do the festivals by region. So, um, yeah, there's absolutely a wonderful amount of online sites. And um, sometimes you want to, uh, for some people, because they may not like crowds, they actually might want to avoid the festival time and some want to be part of the festival. So uh, think about that while you're kind of uh, uh, going through that. So that's a great question. That's great. And let's see, we have, uh, I don't know if we have any questions. Do you see the chat? I can't see the chat. Yeah, so um, Jackie was saying it's a great program. Both my son study there, she's talking about the Rome campus. Um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's transformed my life in ways I can't even imagine. Um, uh, there's so, been so many people who've been transformed by the kind of global experience of St. John's, especially the fact that it's very unique for students to actually have, um, or for universities to have actual campuses abroad. A lot of times they go through like third party affiliates and things like that. Yes. What's really great about the St. John's Rome campus and also the Paris campus as well, is that they are St. John's institutions in which there are St. John's faculty, administrators, um, students signing with their storm cards, just like they do in the Queens campus. There's library resources, uh, laundry rooms, everything for them. So um, it's a wonderful opportunity. It was, it was for us, you know, visiting. It really, like I said, I was sorry that we didn't have that experience when uh, I was at St. John's, but uh, the students seemed to really enjoy it and they immerse themselves in the culture. And talking to some of the students, you would think they lived there, but they immerse themselves in the Italian culture. So it's it's nice to see. We also have one comment from um, Ed uh, uh, Maslock. Maslock. Um, he's from the uh, School of Education Pro Study Abroad Program in Rome in the spring. And he's saying, if anyone is in the audience is interested in visiting us and our program, we welcome you. Yeah, so that's it's um, an absolutely. I really recommend, especially those students who are in the School of Education, to do that program. 
um, because what's really cool about it is they actually get to student teach in many cases in Rome mm -hmm. and interact with Italian uh, kids and school children and see the education system. Um, it was actually when I was studying abroad, I did the, I was not an education major, but I was just interested in kind of the volunteer service aspect of that. And so I actually um, uh, was a gym teacher to um, stu students in Rome when I was abroad. It was one of the best experiences of my life just to kind of understand how different schools operate and the school kids and they were just, it was a wonderful experience. So, yeah, it's, uh, we have all these different programs aligned to different uh, students tastes. So. And I remember when uh, we were going, uh, when we were preparing the trip for the Globetrotters, uh, what was it like a week before, a couple of weeks before we were leaving, we all got together and you, uh, Doug, made a, a presentation along with some of your students that had uh, participated in the abroad program. And what struck me was um, here were students that I didn't, never even went on a plane. You know, never traveled anywhere. And when they were talking about Italy, you know, it was just amazing, you know, uh, because when they're over there, they're visiting other countries. And you could just see they were just so well rounded now because they're exposed to so much culture and the museums and the history. And, you know, you, you can't put a price tag on that type of and you could see how it changed our students where, you know, they weren't exposed to a lot because they don't, they can't afford to travel. And this experience just, uh, just changed them. And they said it changed their lives too. So it was really nice to see. And that was a lot of fun. Then we went to the local Italian restaurant and Rocco made us a traditional Roman meal. And so that was a lot of fun too, just the preparation to, to get ready for the trip. So that was really great. Yeah, so thank you for for helping us with that. No problem. I don't see any other questions, do you? Um, I don't. I know we're um, getting close to I, our time. I, I think I think I think those are the questions. Yeah, this was great. Thank you so much. You really gave us a wonderful escape today uh, to see a beautiful country, Italy, with the beautiful food and wine and. Of course, I'm going to the kitchen after this and getting myself a piece of cheese or something because I'm hungry after <laughs> seeing all this food. But it's terrific, and I'm excited. Uh, we're going to have Doug come the first week of every month, and he'll cover other areas of Italy. So we hope you join us. We hope you join us for our next Power Hour. Just keep in mind, for, for the summer schedule, we've changed. The time it'll still be on Tuesdays, but it'll be at 10 in the morning and it'll be every other week. It will not be weekly. We just feel like everyone's going to be getting out and about and uh, no longer stuck indoors. So uh, we're going to be offering it on a bi weekly basis. So the next one will be very interesting. We have two alums uh, that are in the real estate industry and they're going to talk about real estate during this pandemic and they have some interesting. Uh, details to share with us. So we hope you'll come back and uh, join another conversation with me and with the Power Hour on June 16th. So thanks again. Ciao, everyone. And anybody that was part of the Globetrotters, we hope you'll stay on the call because we uh, all want to just have a little gathering afterwards. So thanks again. Have a great day.